Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, eh, muy buenos días. En la casa nos puede escuchar, Rosa. Sí, todo ok. Perfect. Excelente. Muchas gracias. Uh, we'll switch to English for Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, for being here. We have today the pleasure on our Center for Industrial Engineering and our major in, in operations research. We have Professor Claudia Archetti, who's a professor in the Department of Information System and Decision Science in the Essex Business School. And uh, Claudia is a full professor of operations research. She's a member of operations management and research. The cluster, and she's also the associate dean of ESSEC. She teaches decision analytic optimization for decision making, optimization for MS and PhD program. And prior to the joining ESSEC in 2019, she was appointed at the University of Breschika. <laughs> as assistant professor in 2005 and was an associate professor in 2014. Today she's with us. She has been invited by Professor Romero Larraín, and she's going to present this comparisons of four formulations for the inventory routing problem. Thank you, Claudia, for being here. Here you have a, a coat if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you for, for, for the nice presentation. And let me first thank Romero for giving me the opportunity of visiting uh, your, your university, your department. It was uh, great for me. Uh, it's my first time in Santiago de Chile, and I have to say that I've been really impressed by, by, by especially by the campus, which I find it's, it's really nice. Uh, so thank you, thank you for this very really nice opportunity also to present you. Uh, one of my research topic, um, which is about inventory routing problem, as the title says, uh, which is one of the problems on which I spend most of the, my time in terms of research. I'm studying this problem since more than 50 years already, uh, and it's continuously challenging. And uh, what I'm going to present to you today, it's a recent result that we obtained me together with Ivana Ljubic, who is also a professor at the same department as me uh, at the SEC, uh, about the comparison of different mathematical formulation for, for the Okay, so uh, this is the agenda of my talk. I will first introduce the setting of the problem, as I guess uh, many of you I'm not familiar with the description of the problem itself. I know that Omer and Mordo know very well, but maybe the other do not. So I will describe the problem setting, and then I will uh, I will uh, present a little bit of literature, of related literature, just uh, a selection of that, the one which is most closely related to what I'm going to present you today. And what I'm going to present you today is mainly described in the in these uh, two former subsection aggregated and comparison with these aggregated formulations. So I will present you the mathematical formulations that we have studied and the kind of study that we did on this formulation, both aggregated and disaggregated. I, I will specify later what I mean by the term aggregated and disaggregated. And a little bit of computational analysis at the end. We did some experiments on the formulation itself, on different approaches using this formulation, and then we the state of the approaches, and finally some conclusion. So anyway, how how, how long is should I, I think? Um, you have about. Um, let me tell you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Too many. Uh, Fifty minutes. 50. Okay, yes. fine. 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 thank you. Okay, so let me start with uh, I think there are two students who would like to meet. Thank you. 
Uh, let me let me start with, with the description of the setting of the problem. What is the inventory of the problem? What is the problem about? Okay, the setting of the problem is the following. We have a single supplier here that produces one commodity, and this commodity it has to be distributed from the supplier to the customers of the suppliers. It's, you can see the customers as a set of retailers who in turn face their own demand of the same commodity, and they have to satisfy this demand through the products that are delivered to them by the supplier. So uh, we consider a, um, a given planning horizon that is a set of consecutive periods, we can think about this period as days and as a planning horizon, for example, one week or one month, whatever it is. So we can talk about days, consecutive days, and the planning horizon as a set of consecutive days. And we have to build the uh, plan for this planning horizon, in which the plan is about how, um, uh, what is the quantity that I have to deliver to each customer in each period or in each day of the planning horizon. And when taking this decision, we have to take into account the following. We have to guarantee that each customer is able in any day of the planning horizon to satisfy the corresponding demand of the day. One observation, everything is deterministic in this problem. Everything is known in advance, all the data are known. So I know in advance when I'm doing the planning of, the, of my, of my um, uh, distribution plan, I know what is the demand faced by the customer in each day of the planning horizon. So I have to build the distribution plan in such a way that customers are capable of satisfying their demand in each day of the planning horizon. And when I'm delivering the quantity to a customer, what I can deliver is either the quantities that is sufficient to satisfy the demand for that day or something more. So I can deliver something in excess. For example, to save a visit to the customer the day after, because visiting a customer costs me the travel of the vehicle to visit the customer. So in case I want to save some traveling costs, I can deliver in excess with respect to the daily demand. And this excess quantity will be kept in the inventory at the customer. So each customer has a warehouse with a maximum capacity limit. So I can deliver in excess to the customers to cover the demand not only of the day, but also of the some of the following days, provided that I do not exceed the capacity of the warehouse. Okay. So uh, the supplier acts as a central decision maker. So everything is decided by the supplier. So the supplier decides what is the distribution plan to replenish the customer in every day of and the distribution plan is made by the decision of, in any day of the horizon, we have to decide which customers I am going to visit, what is the quantity that, that they will deliver to the customer, and what are the routes of the vehicles that visit those customers. The vehicles start their routes from the supplier, which is also act as the depot of the vehicle, and end their route at the, at the depot itself. The supplier has a given fleet of vehicles, so a given number of vehicles that are homogeneous, so they all have the same capacity. Um, so uh, the, the, the distribution plan is then decided by the supplier with the goal of minimizing the total cost. And the total cost is given by the routing cost, or if you want the traveling cost of the vehicles that serve the customers in, in each day. Plus inventory holding cost. Indeed, every time I keep something in inventory, I have to pay the inventory holding cost for the quantity that is kept in inventory. And this inventory holding cost is paid both at the customer side, so each customer has an inventory holding cost, and at the supplier side. Also, the supplier has a given fixed production rate, so a given quantity is produced in each day, and this quantity can either be delivered to the customer or can be kept in inventory at the supplier, but again, we pay the inventory holding cost. So the goal is to minimize the overall cost, which is the sum of these terms, routing cost plus inventory cost at the supplier and inventory cost at the, at the, at the, at the cost. So this is the inventory routing problem. 
the setting of the inventory multi -pack. That is an extremely challenging problem. Uh, in, in the class of routing problems in general, uh, I don't know whether you are familiar with bank routing problems, so which are problems about distribution of, of goods to a given certain customer. The inventory routing generalize the basic problem in this class by considering multiple time periods. So we have the time dimension. And this increases a lot the complexity of the problem itself. So it's indeed an extremely challenging problem. Just to tell you, well, I will give you just very general data, but uh, let's say, of course, the research on this basic problem in the class, which is the capacitive vacuity problem, is much larger than the one of the IRP, which is a more recent problem. But just to mention you, the best in class exit solution approach for the CVRP nowadays is able to solve instances with, I would say, 300 customers, more or less. For the IRP, even nowadays, the largest dimension, of course, it depends on the number of the days in the planning horizon, but if you have 30 days, no, sorry. If you have three days, you can go up to 50 customers at most, no more than this, with the current uh, best, best exit story. So it's extremely challenging, and it has recently attracted a lot of research. Uh, here it's a, a not exhaustive list of exit solution approaches which appeared in the last 10 years. And I have high, highlighted in, in green these branch and cut algorithm here by Coelho and Laporte appeared in 2014 in the International Journal of Production Economics. And the, the last one, which is a branch and price by Gerson Irak and Coelho, which appeared in TS. This is the only branch and price algorithm that has been proposed in literature for the inventory routing. All the other access solution approaches that have been proposed are branch and cut algorithms. What is the difference between the two? In branch and cut algorithms, what you do is that you use a formulation in which all the variables are there. You have a polynomial number of variables and you insert cuts dynamically only by the variable. So you have a dynamic generation of cuts for cost trends. Instead, in branch and price algorithms, you have an exponential number of variables. So what you do is that you generate variables dynamically. So, uh, as soon as you need them, you generate them and so Typically, branch and price algorithms are the, the nowadays the standard best exit approaches for the capacity the BRP, so for the basic problem. This is not the case for the inventory routing. In inventory routing, branch and price doesn't work as well as for the capacity the BRP. Italian experiment will give you. Uh, tell you why at the end of the presentation, why branch and price is not working so well in the IRP. Okay, uh, I will focus now on the branching cut algorithms because our study um, is about formulations uh, with a polynomial number of variables. So we are not talking about branching random price. So when, when focusing on branching cut algorithms, here you see uh, um, a classification of the approaches on the basis of the fact that these approaches uses an aggregated or a disaggregated formulation. And here you, you see also what I mean with aggregated or disaggregated. Aggregated formulation are those in which variables do not have a vehicle, uh, sorry, an index associated with the vehicle they refer to. But when I say, okay, I'm constructing the route, well, then I insert an index K for the vehicle to which the route is assigned. This is done in disaggregated formulation where you have vehicle index. In aggregated formulation, you don't have vehicle index. Okay? So the aggregated formulation are more compact. They have a fewer number of variables because you don't have the dimension associated with the number of vehicles in the fleet. Uh, we will see the comparison between the two formulation and the advantages of one with respect to the others. But anyway, if we look at the uh, approaches proposed in the literature, we see that they are more, uh, more or less half and half. Some of these approaches use aggregated formulation. Some of them use disaggregated formulation. Uh, aggregated formulation, as I mentioned, have the advantages, the advantage of having fewer variables. So typically you have smaller formulation, more compact, so easier to solve. These aggregated formulation have some advantages with my, which might be related, might be 
we will see in a moment, might be related to stronger relaxation. But this is questionable, as we will see in a moment. OK, so our goal, uh, the goal of our study is uh, about studying. We started by studying aggregated formulation. And our goal is to theoretically examine the, uh, the strength of different formulation for the problem, strength measured in terms of value of the corresponding linear relaxation. So what we did, it was analyzing different formulation, not new, they were all already proposed in the literature, different formulations for the IRP to analyze whether one dominates the other in terms of strength of the linear relaxation. This kind of analysis was not done for the IRP, and in fact, it's extremely important because uh, and it's an it's a, it's a important point knowing the, the, the strength of the linear relaxation when you want to solve the mathematics the problem itself. So this was our goal, analyzing the strength of the linear relaxation associated with different formulation for the area, starting by the aggregated formulation and then comparing with the disaggregated. Okay, so let us now go to uh, introduce the formulation, but we first need some notation for describing the, the detailed setting of the problem. So we consider a directed complete graph. I, I, I focus here, here the, the term directed because it is important, as you will see, in the formulation that we use, we need a directed formulation, that is, we need to know in which sense each root is traversed. So I need to know whether I'm going from vertex one to vertex two or from vertex two to vertex one. If the distance is the same, uh, going from zero, one, two, three, zero, or going from zero, three, two, one, zero is the same. So if the distances are symmetric, you don't really need to know in which direction you traverse it. Okay. And this is the case for almost all the instances of the IRP. However, for the formulations that we are studying and comparing, you need to know in which direction uh, the route is traversed because of the constraints that are introduced, as we will see. Okay, so the problem, and we consider a directed complete graph where the supplier, which is also the depot for the vector routes, is, is, uh, is uh, node zero. And in the, this is the number of customers, and capital H is the horizon, so the number of days that we consider. And we have a fleet of uh, N homogeneous vehicles, all have the same capacity, and all are associated with the same cost in terms of cost of traversing each arc of the graph. The production rate that the supplier is given, the production rate for each day, as well as the demand of each customer per day, and also the maximum inventory. Uh, capacity at, at each customer. Note that we don't have any inventory capacity at the supply. And we we have a given initially inventory level for each customer and for the supplier. And the uh, split deliveries are not allowed. What does it mean? It means that if I decide to visit the customer in a day, this customer has to be visited by one vehicle only. I cannot split the quantity that I want to deliver to the customer in two or more visits. Then in terms of cost, I have the routing costs that are costs associated with each arc of the graph that I pay in case a vehicle traverses this, this arc. And then I have inventory, unitary inventory loading costs, which are paid for each unit in inventory each day. A question? Yeah. Uh, why do you need the triangle inequality? Is something related to your formulation? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's um, as we impose that each customer is visited at most once here. We are kind of assuming that you visit a customer only if you serve it. If the triangle inequality would not uh, be satisfied, it would it might be convenient to you to pass through a customer to go from one to the other. So that's why we assume triangle inequality. But indeed, uh, what what is a, also a formal assumption uh, before that is that the all the distances are calculated through shortest path. So you pre-process all distances by calculating shortest paths between any pair of nodes, and then automatically you have that the triangle inequality is satisfied. Okay, and then we have to determine the distribution that minimizes the total cost. 
Okay, let's look at the aggregated formulations first. So what are the decisions that we have to take? For each day in the planning horizon, we have to decide which are the customers that are served. This decision is, is modeled through uh, the visiting variables, Z, which are binary, those associated with customer, telling us whether I visit the customer I in the AT, and the integer is that those associated with the depot. So for each, uh, that is not zero, for each day T, this variable tells me how many routes I will perform in day T. So this is the first decision. Then second decision, when I visit the customer, I have to decide what is the quantity that I deliver to the customer. And this is modeled through the continuous variable capital QIT. That is the quantity that I deliver to customer I at day T. Then I have these inventory variables measuring the inventory level at the customer or at supplier in the T. This is an auxiliary variable, which is simply given by equation. So it's not really needed, but for the read of modeling the problem itself, it's simply uh, better to have it. But it's an auxiliary variable. It's not really a decision. And finally, I have to define the routes for the for, for the vehicles but, uh, through the customers that are served in each day. And this is modeled through an uh, X IJT binary variable so that defines which are the X servers in each day. Okay, so this is the set of variable. And here is the formulation, what is called formulation A, which is incomplete, as you will see in a moment. Okay, on top we have the objective function, which is, I will not enter into the details of modeling because I'm not have that. But anyway, the objective function is the sum of the three cost terms. So the first is the inventory cost that the supplier, second is the inventory cost that the customer, the overall inventory cost of the customer, and the last one is the routing cost. How do you take the capacity? The capacity of the vehicle. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's not here. Okay. Is that because okay. it's, it's incomplete? I will see, I will show you in a moment. So objective function. Then we have the, the, the first block of constraints. Matthias Club has a question. Matthias. Hello. How are you, everybody? Um, I, ha I have a question regarding the inventory cost. Is it always the case that it's independent of time? Or, or do you require that it's independent of time? The HI cannot be HIT? Yeah, it can be. It can be. Yes, you, you're right. I mean, uh, I mean it, it will not change the formulation itself. This is just the sort of setting of the IFP, but in case you have uh, an inventory cost which is dependent on time, provided that is the data, then nothing else changes in the formulation. Oh, okay, so you you're, you're, will not use that for any kind of like properties or stuff uh, that, you, that are needed to, to solve the problem? No, 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 no. No, we never investigated in this case. No, but you're right. In this case, you might investigate some properties, you're right, but we didn't do that. No. Good point. Yeah. I was just the, the, the supplier production rate is fixed. Yes. So even though we're planning of how much I'm inventory, I'm, I cannot decide to produce less in order to inventory less. No, no, no. This is not because production is not a, a decision variable in the IRP that exists indeed the, the generalization of the IRP which is called production which is putting problem which is not because then the IRP plus the decision of, of production yes that's even more challenging <laughs> okay so any other question okay so then the first block of constraint is about defining the inventory level. The first two constraints define the inventory level at the supplier, the first one, and at each customer, the second class of constraints. The, the last two constraints in the first block defines instead the maximum inventory capacity at each customer. And they link the quantity variables with the two, with the visiting variables. Then we have a set of a block of constraints, which I call loading constraints, which are uh, degree constraints. So the in degree, in terms of R variables, the in degree has to be equal to the out degree for each customer in each day, for each vertex in each day. And it has to correspond to the uh, visiting variable set. And finally, we have the constraints defining variables. 
Okay, this formulation, which we call formulation A, is not a complete formulation for the IFP because two things are missing, which are the following. We are not defining the capacity constraint, so there's nothing in the final formulation that tells that, 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 that fixes the capacity constraint. And there is no connectivity constraint. Indeed, the root constraint are just degree constraints here, but there's nothing mentioning that the roots have to be connected to the B. So these two elements are missing. So we will now see how we can complete formulation A by, by introducing constraints that, that allow you to, to satisfy capacity connectivity constraint in different ways. And we will compare these different ways for uh, formulating capacity and connectivity constraints. So let's start by, uh, as I, I repeat, all these different, of course, for each way you obtain a different formulation. The formulations that I will analyze and present are not new. They have been already started. We will compare them in terms of value of the linear condensation. So let's start from capacity constraint. We analyze two possible ways of modeling capacity constraint. One, which we call the compact formulation, that is by uh, this, in this first way, we still obtain a formulation with a polynomial number of variables and constraints. You first, first notice that formulation A has a polynomial number of constraints. Well, with this first way of modeling capacity constraint, we will obtain a formulation which is still compact. So with a polynomial number of variables and constraints. Uh, we call this formulation load-based formulation, is known as load-based formulation, also as single commodity formulation. The idea of this formulation is the following. We introduce a new set of variables called load variables, L, I, J, T, so they are associated with each arc and time period. And these variables are continuous and they measure the load on the vehicle when traversing arc I, J at time T. And then when introducing these variables, we can model capacity constraint by introducing the constraints two in this slide. So constraint two is flow balance or flow constraints. They say that for each node i and time t, the, um, the sum of the load entering into node i minus the sum of the load exiting from node i has to be equal to the, the quantity that is delivered to node i in case i is a customer or minus the sum of the quantity delivered delivered to all customers at time t if i is the dealer. So in practice, what they say is that when I visit a given node, the, I, I reach this node through a vehicle which has some load on board. Then if the node is a customer, I, I deliver the quantity to, to the customer. So the load when leaving the customer is the load that I had before minus what I delivered. If instead the, 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 the vertex is the depot, then when I left from the depot, I have to, to have on my vehicles the entire quantity that I want to deliver to the customer. Okay. And then the, cost, the constraint 2B imposes the capacity of the vehicle. So they, they say that for each R, the load on the vehicle that traverses each R has to be smaller than the capacity. Okay, and they also link the load variables with the x variable, so I can have a positive load only in case the path is different. And how do you handle multiple uh, trucks? So you have two, three. Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't enter into this this property here. Well, what you can show, I don't have time to show here that. Uh, remember, we I said that split deliveries are not allowed. Mm -hmm. So if you visit a customer. This customer will be visited once. Okay. So each point is, is visited at most one. This, is, this ensures that each arc is traversed at most by one vehicle. So you don't need to know which is the vehicle that is traversing that. Okay? So you don't, you don't need the vehicle index. But this is due to the fact that you have no split deliveries. Mm -hmm. In case of split deliveries, this formulation is no longer valid. Okay, so uh, by introducing, by adding these constraints to the formulation A that we had earlier, this formulation. So if you take A plus this constraint two, we, uh, we obtain a valid formulation for the IRP because constraint two, they, they both guarantees vacuum capacity, but also 
connectivity of the roots. And the connectivity is due to the fact that the load is monotonically decreasing when you traverse the arc of the roots. So at the same time, you can, you can capacity, uh, satisfaction, and con connectivity. So this formulation is a complete valid formulation for the IRT and this compound with a common um, predominant number of variables in cost. So this is a first valid formulation for the IRP. And then let's see now uh, an alternative way of modeling capacity constraint, this time by introducing an exponential number of constraints, which are called fractional capacity cuts. So this alternative way has the disadvantage that you need exponentially many constraints for formulating the capacity constraint but has the advantage that you don't need any longer the new variables L. You have less variables, but you have exponential limiting constraints. The fractional capacity cuts are modeled this way. For each possible subset of uh, customers, S, and each time period T, and this generates the exponential limiting constraints, you have a constraint saying that the sum of the arcs entering into the subset or exiting is the same, you can use one or the other, from this subset, has to be greater than or equal to uh, the sum of the quantity, the sum of the quantity delivered to the customer in the subset divided by the cost. Okay. So these are the fractional capacity cut. You have one for each uh, possible subset of customers. So you have two to the n times the, the, the the, the, the time horizon constraints of this kind. So they are exponentially many. So uh, and it, you cannot write with them. You have to separate them dynamically. The separation is easy because you can use a max flow mean kind algorithm. So the separation is easy, but you have to build a region and you have to separate them dynamically. But again, these constraints, as for the low constraint, they guarantee at the same time connectivity and capacity. So by taking formulation A plus fractional capacity cap, you obtain a valid formulation for the I. So our first result was about comparing these two formulations. So A plus low constraint versus A plus fractional capacity cap. And we compare the linear relaxation of them. And what we obtain. Uh, well, uh, I will show, not show you the proof, but we prove that if you take the body intron associated with the load formulation and you project out the load variables, you obtain the polyhedron of formulation A plus fractional capacity cap. So the value of the linear relaxation of the two formulations is exactly the same. So if you use one or the other, you obtain the same value of the linear relaxation. I'm just talking about value of linear relaxation, but the value of linear relaxation is indeed informative and something that counts a lot when solving the problem towards money. This result is consistent with what was already proven years ago for the VRP in this paper there, but was never approved for the IRP in which you have additional variables, specifically continuous variables, which makes a lot of difference. And also you have the time damage. So we proved that. So now, what does it mean? What are the consequences of these results? When you compare the two formulation, you have the load formulation, which is compact but with more variables, and the fractional capacity cut formulation, which is with exponentially many constraints, but less variables. Well, if you compare the two, practically speaking, from an implementation point of view, is that if you use what? They provide the same value of the relaxation. If you use the load formulation, practically speaking, in terms of implementation, it's much easier because you simply have to write the formulation and click solve, that's it. You don't need to implement any branching cut, no separation, no nothing, okay? Not only, uh, uh, looking at the, 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 the commercial solvers, we did the experiments with simplex, but probably is, is, is the, it's similar. Access solvers typically, works better when they have the complete formulation of the problem because their, yeah, their, their, their automatic heuristic method has the complete information on the formulation that they so it can find better heuristic solution and also at least in simplex i don't know whether it's the same in Robin because i'm using simplex the automatic cuts and other uh, automatic stuff 
In simplex, are disabled when you define for your own callbacks, which are the, the, the kind of uh, routines for separating uh, dynamically inserted tasks. So, from this point of view, the, the low population has some advantages with respect to the using fraction capacity. Okay, so this was the first result that we obtained, and then we continued by looking at uh, strengthening. Well, uh, what you can do is also strengthen this uh, capacity constraint, both for the compact and for the exponential size formulation. Uh, first observation is that when all the parameters in the IRP, that is um, demand, uh, production rate, uh, capacity of vehicles, and maximum energy battery level, when all, all these data are integered, then you always obtain an optimal solution in which the value of the few variables are integrated as well. This is quite easy. But then when it, this is the case, you can strengthen capacity constraint by imposing that if you visit the customer in practice, you deliver at least one unit. This is the idea of the constraint here. Okay? If you visit the customer, if you visit the vertex, you deliver at least one unit to the customer. This way, with this consideration, you can strengthen the, 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 the load formulation that we, we have seen before by introducing these constraints, which are quite easy. But they they indeed improve the, the, the value of the formulation, the, the, the value of the, the relaxation of the formulation. So we introduced this strengthening constraint 14 in the load formulation, and we obtained they are still polynomial, as you see. And so we obtained this strengthened load formulation. And then we verified whether there could be something, um, something similar for the formulation with fractional capacity cut, so with exponentially mini constraint. And indeed, it exists. So we defined what, uh, what we call multi-star inequalities for the IRP. Why we call them multi-star inequalities? Because there exists in the literature the, the multi-star inequalities for the capacity and the vector routing problem. But this inequality has never been generalized to the IRP. And what we did here was, OK, taking these inequalities and generalizing to the IRP. And what you obtain are the inequalities that you see in this slide which are uh, not being less than the fractional capacity cut that we have seen earlier, where the right hand side is strengthened by intro the introduction of these two terms. So the, we have the, the, this, the right hand side together with the first term of the left, sorry, left hand side together with the first term of the right hand side provides you the fractional capacity cut that we have seen earlier. Then we start that the right hand side with these two terms, which are measured in the flow, and um, of the arcs that goes from customers in, sorry, from the vertices in S to customers outside this vertex S and vice versa. Okay, so these, these two terms measure the flow of the arcs from the subset S that you are considering to the customers that are outside S. We prove that these inequalities are valid for, for the IRP. So they strengthen the fractional capacity. So you can, you can obtain a strengthened formulation with exponential mini constraint by considering multi-star inequality instead of fractional capacity. And then an analysis which was similar to the formula one, and we proved again that you obtain a very similar result. So if you consider the strengthened low formulation and the formulation A with the multi-star inequalities, then the, the uh, linear relaxation is equivalent. Okay, so again, we have equivalent valence formulation in terms of value of the linear relaxation. And final, final analysis was about connectivity constraint. I already mentioned that fractional capacity cuts or multi-star inequality, as well as load or standard load formulation, they already provide connected solution. But in case you want to strengthen further the, the linear relaxation, you can introduce additional connectivity constraints. What happens in this case, again, you can model these connect additional connectivity constraints in a compact or in an exponential way. In a compact way, you can model that by using multi-commodity flow formulation. That is this one. Uh, again, you introduce new variables. And in this case, as you will see, they are a lot, still polynomial by a lot. So we can specifically, we introduce a variable FIJTL, which has continuous variable that represents the path from the depot 
to uh, to customer L traversing our, our IJ in the ET. So we have a variable for each arc IJ for each customer and for each day. So an order of magnitude of n cube to the time to the the, the number of um, plan of of uh, time periods. So there are really a lot, and these variables measure the path from the depot to each customer in each day of the planning horizon. And when introducing these, there are continuous variables, and through these variables, you can measure, you can model connectivity constraint in a similar way as we did for the load constraint. In this case, for each vertex i, we say that the difference then between the entering flow and the exiting flow from the vertex is equal to the binary variable, if i is equal to the customer L associated with the variable, is equal to minus the binary variable if i is the depot, and zero if otherwise. So the flow has to, to be zero if they if we're simply traversing the act to reach the customer, Otherwise, it's equal to one or minus one. And then these constraints link the, the F variables with the um, X variables that are the traversal of the X. If, if you don't have split uh, 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 deliveries, deliveries, zero should not be because you're always traversing to one customer only and no other um, will use that. Art. So, so you mean here? Yes. No, the, the, the zero comes from the fact that if you are considering the path, for example, if you have a route that visits the vertex, the deep zero, and then one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. okay, then if you're considering the path from zero to four, these uh -huh. flow, these flows said that the, the 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 flow in minus the flow out for the intermediate vertices has to be zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, constraint, and they can be shown that they are not uh, dominated by the low constraints. So if you add these constraints to the formulation, you strengthen the linear relaxation. So this is the first possible way to model connectivity constraint. Again, polynomial number of variables is constrained, but a lot of variables, a lot of additional variables, or uh, you can model the connectivity constraint without introducing new variable, but with an exponential number of constraints, which are the generalized subtool elimination constraints, which are the subtool elimination constraints that are used for capacitive evaluative problem, in which we consider um, the specific pattern size. Specifically, these constraints are, are modeled this way. For any subset of uh, customers, the constraint says that the sum of the X variables associated with the X link, linking any pairs of customers in the subset has to be smaller than or equal to the sum of the Z of the visiting variable associated with the customer in the subset. So no subtool can be, uh, can be um, created. Okay. And then what we did, similar to, to, to what we did before, we're comparing, was comparing the two ways of formulating connectivity constraint. And not surprisingly, we obtained exactly the same. <laughs> so again, if you take the low or the strengthened log formulation and you add on top of that the multi-commodity flow, you obtain a polyhedron in which if you project out the uh, the L and the F variable, you obtain the polyhedron, which is given by the uh, formulation, the fractional capacity that and generalized to the elimination constraint. So the value of the linear relaxation is exactly the same. Okay. So again, we have the same uh, considerations that we did at the beginning. So overall, this is the kind of um, uh, picture of the connection between the formulation in which the arrow means if you have an arrow between a formulation and the other one, it means that the the the, the a the, the first one is as strong as the second one. And as we see, we see all the formulations which are equivalent to each other. So by if you consider just the compact counterpart, we have the load formulation. Which is dominated by the uh, load plus the connectivity constraint, so the multi-commodity flow constraint, which is dominated by the strengthened load 
pass the multi commodity formulation, and all of them are equivalent to the let's say exponential cambio. And finally, what we did was analyzing what happened if we consider the disaggregated formulation. So let's consider now the case in which we introduce the vehicle index. The vehicle index, the, the, the index that tell you which vehicle is doing what. You need to know which vehicle is traversing the room and which vehicle is delivering the quantity to a customer in here. So we introduce the vehicle index in the quantity variables, in the root variables, in the x variables, so in q, in x, the root variables, and in z, the binary variables. So that we know which vehicle is visiting each customer each day. Then this way we obtain the disaggregated formulation. It's very similar, so I will not enter into the details of this. Just note that in the disaggregated formulation, the capacity constraints are easily modeled here. For each vehicle, we simply say, okay, the sum of the quantity delivered by the vehicle each day has not exceeded the capacity. What is missing in this formulation are connectivity constraints. And uh, well, I will not repeat all the stuff. You can model them in uh, uh, in uh, in a um, Exponential way, or uh, is also the you, you can have also the fractional capacity cap. You can uh, model that in exponential way or in a compact way. But anyway, we show that. So assume you consider the the, the the exponential way of modeling subtrusion elimination constraint and fractional capacity cap. We set both of them in our disaggregated formulation, formulation D. So if we insert both of them. What you obtain is that you do not gain nothing, anything, sorry, from disaggregation. So if you take the disaggregated formulation, including uh, generalized subtrusive elimination of bed and fractional capacity cut, then the value of the linear relaxation is exactly the same as the one of the aggregated formulation. I don't know what's happening. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So the disaggregation doesn't give you anything. So if it doesn't give you anything, even that you have more variables, better not to use it. Okay, so this was our conclusion, at least theoretically yeah. speaking. I probably is a problem because it's not doing any issues on on the internet about this. Go ahead, please. Okay, so uh, so concluding on our let's say theoretical finding. We we have seen that disaggregation is not giving anything, and exponential formulation are as strong as compact formulation. So this was what we we obtained theoretically, and then we did some. Uh, Uh, different ways of using this formulation, especially we, we focus on the aggregated formulation, these different ways of using that, and also comparing them with some state of the art solution approaches, the ones that I mentioned earlier, a branch and cut by Coelho and Lapar, and the branch and price by, by Coelho, Lapar, and Zimita. Huh? So, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, the result, <laughs> uh, first, well, the branch of price is a uh, story, so I will not uh, spend words on that because it's However, they they use a uh, non directed formulation. So okay. they, they, they they exploit the fact that the uh, distances are symmetric. So they use half of the variable of the other variables. They can use that because um, they they don't need to know the direction in which the route is traversed. Instead, note that for the load formulation, if you remember the, the load formulation, you need to know what is the entering flow and what is the uh, exiting flow in each node. So you need to know in which direction the root is traversed. So when you use the load formulation, you need a directed formulation, so the complete set of X variables, Why they had just half of them. Okay, I will continue. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so we, we use the batch one instances that has up to 50 customers, up to six days, and up to five vehicles. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I will try to summarize in words what, what came out from, from the experience. We tried three approaches for solving the problem. All of them are based on the aggregate recommendation. This one is just giving to CPLEX the compact formulation that is the standard load formulation. Okay? Just the standard flow without the connectivity constraint, the multi commodity flow, because in that case, the variables are too many. A simple polynomial that the variables are too many, so you cannot use this formulation anyways. So we just use the standard load formulation, we give it to C. Then, second approach, we build a branch and cut in which we use the standard flow, and then we separate the, the, the generalized to the linear constraint by the standard, uh, through the standard. Uh, max flow in cat algorithm. So we had a version cat, standard load plus generalized to the elimination state. And then the third approach was again, slide, okay, the benders. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> the, the first one is the benders in which we take the base formulation begins again the standard load, but then we use the multi commodity flow formulation in which these variables are, are moved to the subproblem in a band expansion. I don't know, uh, I don't know whether in Chrome, but in CPS for sure you have libraries that uh, implement directly annotated banders or automatic banders. So you can simply write the formulation and then the CPS. Okay, the the F, the F variables, you move them to you move them to the subproblem and it automatically generates the band start and so on. So we use this uh, last uh, way of solving as, as well. Okay, so I summarize the results. I just have a couple of Summarizing the results, just give you the summary. What we obtained is that in terms of value of lower bound, upper bound, and in general, optimality gap, you will see the comparison among the approaches. The, the gray line is our compact formulation. The base S load formulation. The yellow one is the branching cut, the blue one is the benders, and the light blue and the orange one are the two uh, benchmark approaches taken from, from, from the literature. The, the light blue is the, the branch and cut from Korean apart, and the orange one is the branch of price by this and so on. So, what we obtain is that in terms of what you want to get, our approaches, all of them are much better, as you see in this slide. This, this figure, this figure measures the number of businesses for which the optimality gap is smaller than the value reported on the horizontal line. So the, the, the more the, the curve is on the on the left, the better it is. So the best one is the gray one, which is the compact formulation, followed by vendors, followed by range cut. In general, we uh, we observed that vendors is better than bracket cut because everything is done automatically by syntax. So the, 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 those two formulations are equivalent, but given that everything is done automatically by syntax, syntax is faster. But the compact formulation goes better for automatic gap, but all the three approaches are better than the two of the state of the art. However, this doesn't mean that we are doing better than that because if we, uh, we will yeah. see, if we then check Instead of optimality, again, the number of instances sold to optimality, we are by far worse. So the, the higher is the curve here, the better it is. And these three are our approaches. The two are the ones from the literature. So we sold much fewer instances than the one of the literature. Why? Uh, because we didn't spend time in improving the relaxation. So we ended up in having branch about, and this is explained by this number over here. We, we had some statistics about the number of nodes visiting in our uh, solution approaches at termination, and this is by far more than the ones reported in the paper by two uh, competitors, let's say, that is because we didn't strengthen the, the, the relaxation of uh, ethic, ethic. So that's, that's the, our final conclusion. So that's it. So uh, concluding, well, this I will skip this. Mm -hmm. Concluding, we wanted uh, so we we 
our main contribution was again was was theoretically uh, the showing the, the the comparison of the relaxation of the formulation. We want this to strengthen the benefit of right related formulation. It has still to be investigated. We also show that um, if you can use automatic vendors, then with respect to your own branching branching card, or at least we did a very naive implementation of the of the min min card uh, algorithm. You can do much better, but if you use automatic the automatic libraries from the commercial servers, typically you gain something. Uh, and as for future work, um, uh, when we were doing this, this all this, when we were first submitting this paper, we then ended up in a paper which has been published in 2021 in Egypt by these these uh, researchers from Greece, which is nowadays the best, absolutely the best exa solver for the IRP. It's a branch and cut on an anti formulation, and there they have a two commodity flow formulation, that is for each R, they have two variables measuring the load of the vehicles and tra traversing the R and the receiver capacity. This way they obtain a formulation, which is, uh, let's say, smarter than the ones that we use. They, they, are, they are able to couple them uh, with, with the, some inequalities related to the quantity to deliver. And with this formulation, they obtain the various results currently available for the IP. They also have some other tricks related to computation of upper bounds, but okay, this is the, the best access solver nowadays for me. And we want to compare, we would like to compare our formulations with the one they study in So this is something to the refugee. And okay, let's see. Thank you for your attention. This paper has been in Egypt and it's open access. So Thank you very much, Claudia. We have time for questions. If you want, if you need to leave it, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, do you think that your result that says that the aggregated and the disaggregated uh, populations are equivalent? Are we through similar problems like the multiple GFP or the VRP with multiple vehicles that are, are on the homogeneous screen? Yeah. And it should go through, right? Yes, yes, yes. I think so. I think so. Yes, yes. The IRP has some specificities related to the presence, of, specifically, these Q variables, continuous variables. These are what makes the difference with respect to many other routing problems. And this is also, I had no time to, to talk about it. This, the presence of these Q continued variables is also the reason why the branch and price algorithm is not as effective as it is for the CVRP. Because these continuous variables makes the continue, the linear relaxation much weaker. And this is a disaster for when you use cost of power generation, this is a disaster. You cannot, it's no longer effective. But so they, they are a little bit specific because of the presence of these variables, but definitely I we observe similar results for other variants of life. So that that, that observation of price of price, uh, also if the data is integer, you know, then you yeah, you, it's you still holds. Uh, it's still holds because then the the variables are are integer, but still they are not binary. It's yeah, not binary. yeah, it's a binary. Yeah, I, I understand, and that's good. Yeah. So for the TSP, the single commodity and the two commodity are equivalent. Yes. So I was a bit surprised that apparently for the IRP they are not. I don't. We 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 with this. Yes, we know about that. So that's why we would like to investigate the the link between our formulation and the two commodity formulation that the Greek uh, uh, researchers have, have used. Um, we also think that if we take the basic two commodity formulation. It should be equivalent to the single commodity one, but in their formulation, they have some other constraints and tricks that, is, that make it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, what about the split delivery structure? Is there some way, or is that it's so terrible complicated? Who writes the problem? Uh, the 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 inventory routing with split deliveries is starting to be studied now. I see what well, I, I am studying it uh, with, with a PhD student, and I have seen 
of contributions, but mainly in robotic algorithms, not for the exact algorithms. Because as I am, also, if you take the formulation and introduce the deliveries, you you draw dramatically the kind of the instances that you can support money. I mean, it, 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 it's really a mess. Uh, and and, uh, and many of the results that we have here, you cannot use them. For example, the aggregated formulation doesn't work. So you need a disaggregated one because uh, because you need the customer more than once and then you cannot control the flow. Yeah. So, uh, as, as, as you're aware of, there are many uh, ways to strengthen some of these formulations using bad cuts. For instance, sometimes you might you can know that you must customer between a window of time because otherwise you, you to prevent a break in a, a metric breaks, right? Or, or also for the for the aggregated, uh, not for the disaggregated formulation, you can also use symmetry breaking constraints. So you don't have ambiguity in the way you assign vehicles to routes. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, is there any chance that this kind of constraints also may affect the lower bound, the, the linear relaxation? Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, what, what, uh, not in this study, in former studies that we made, uh, we're just consulting the IRP. We, we introduce this kind of inequalities, so um, in other things, it's per time, per, per, per let's say, interval time, or also since breaking. Um, yes, they, they are doing something, not too much, but they are doing something. Even symmetry breaking, yeah, they, they are effective. They, they change something, not too much, but something. Because uh, it also may happen that even without having any effect on the relaxation, they might have an effect on solution banks anyway, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think Matthias is raising his hand. Okay. Yes, uh, Claudia, I have a question regarding your experiments. So <laughs> when you compared your formulations and tested their performance, did you use, did you use a, uh, an incumbent, a starting point, a uh, starting fe feasible solution. Uh, was it the same for each formulation? No. Or did you start it from scratch without any starting solution? No, we, we didn't provide any starting solution, any formulation. But uh, this is consistent to what has been done also with the two approaches we compared with. They had no no, let's say hip start, no heuristic solution they start with. Instead, the, the Greek uh, researchers, one reason why they bring such good solution is also because they, they in the paper, they also develop a couple search uh, for, for, for finding a heuristic solution, and this solution is given as a hip start for, for the solver. But uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I I, I see because you were you were mentioning that there were some formulations I believe was the yeah the the compact ones that are better suited for the solver to find better uh, uh, heuristic approaches. So mm -hmm. I imagine that if you if you use a good incumbent in, in those formulations, maybe you can like jump start the procedure and bootstrap other solutions. Yeah, sure, sure, definitely. Yes, 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 absolutely. That this is definitely true because this is exactly what the Greek uh, researchers did. Well, I mean, I think this is a big advantage of the of their approach, the fact that they have a very strong deep start. But uh, as we wanted to compare the the, 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 the let's say the bounds that we were we obtained by the pure formulation and the approach, we didn't use any deep start. So, but, but that's for sure you're right. If you use a good uh, heuristic solution to start with, you can improve uh, a lot. Okay. Uh, in your results, you compare iterations. Yes. And uh, if you put time instead, because one is a vendor generation and another one you go through branch and bound. Uh, so. Uh, I don't know. I mean, well, our, our limit is two hours. So okay. we, get, we have a limit on. on uh, on a time limit. What I was comparing, what, uh, what I was showing you at the, at the end was 
uh, more than the iteration, the number of branch and bound nodes visited uh -huh. by, by our free approaches at termination. So when, when the, the solver was stopped after two hours, or, or before it, the solution is found before, this is the average number of nodes in the, the branch and bound tree visited. And, and we observe that this number is at least one order of magnitude larger than the one of our competitors. And, and this might be due to the, this is probably due to the fact that they have um, some further, well, the branch enterprise has a stronger relaxation, that's okay. But also in uh, in the other branch of Cadley, they have some inequalities to strengthen the relaxation. So they were able to visit much fewer nodes than us. Okay, so you know, if you convert this to time, it will be shorter. Yes, I mean the time per node is much much shorter. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Good question. Uh, have you thought of including formulations based on mirror time examining into the mix? Because that is the simplest and most aggregated. No, 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 no. We didn't use mirror type examining. Uh, we might try, but but the point is that as far as as we know, at least for the TSP, the the Miller target zone is the one that gives you the weakest yeah, right? even weaker than the single commodity or, or so, so that's why but but it might be we didn't try. It's true that that you have much fewer variables with the Miller target zone, so it might be, but good yeah. one we didn't try. Thank you very much, Claudia. And everybody at home, we invite you for next week to our next uh, final presentation. Thank you very much. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.